<clears throat> All right, let's get this party started. I uh, I tried to do this earlier today, but it was for a D restaurant, and using a D restaurant to make a submission video is not the smartest idea. Come to find out. So hopefully we're a little little D rusted now. We're good to go. This will be my submission video for AGDQ 2019 or whatever marathon I might submit to after that. Um, this will be for Illusion of Gaia, any percent. I'll also be submitting for Secret of Evermore, any percent, no Verminator skip, but that'll be in a later video. So yeah, I'm Solar Cell 007. I've been streaming for just over a year now. I do, so I, I have some experience talking to chat and dealing with distractions while I'm playing a, a speed run. Currently I'm sixth place on the leaderboards for Illusion of Gaia in any percent. And looking back through GDQ's history, Illusion of Gaia was in SGDQ in 2012 and 2016. Both had 100% as the category for the runs. So I figured I'd try and get a, an any percent run in for submission. I know there are, including myself, four runners, at least, who are going to be submitting for Illusion of Gaia. I don't know if they'll be submitting for 100% or any percent, but the group hope is that either one of us gets our run submitted and accepted, or that the game gets accepted as a race, and we would all be okay with a race. And that would also be any percent for that race, and we'll have to designate that whenever we submit the videos. Um, now what's exciting about GDQ for me, so as I said, I've been streaming for just a little over a year now, and obviously the goal when you're a speedrunner is to be accepted in the GDQ. And a lot of things that, or something that holds people back is that it's usually far. Most of the time the runners have to take a flight to where they're going, and it's a lot of money so a lot of people don't submit because of that. But I, I saw this time that AGDQ 2019 is going to be in Rock Hall, Maryland. And that, my friends, is just two hours away from my where I live. So regardless of if I get accepted or not for whatever I submit, I will be there. Because that's super close. I'll get to meet everybody. And I'm just excited for it. So I'm, I'm excited. I'm sure it'll be a great time. So anyway, let's get to Illusion of Gaia. I'll do my best to commentate on the tips and tricks and all the little glitches we do. Uh, i also try to give portions to say, oh, well, you can read donations now if we have some for the game. I'll have to think about what kind of donation incentives we could have. There is going to be a month, many months, in between when the schedule is released and when AGQ actually is, so... Whoever gets accepted is going to be practicing a lot for those months, so there are weird things we can do. I mean, heck, we could even do a boss blindfolded if we're having trouble thinking of things. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go ahead and get started. You don't want to die in front of 100,000 people. Or, it doesn't even have to be GDQ. It could be some small marathon where you only have, let's say, you have 20, 30 people watching, but you're on a schedule. And so you do have a time estimate, and you can build your estimate for deaths and safeties and all that, but in a marathon you want to show off the game while looking skillful, and if you are more prone to taking deaths because you're doing risky strats, that's not really doing the game justice, and it's not really showing your skills off. And it's not going to help you as a streamer either if you're a streamer in speedrunning, because people are going to be like, oh, this guy is just not good I don't want to watch him play this game and so you build in some safety strats like we have for this game at the very least you collect five red jewels you get an extra defense point so you can take more damage and you get an extra herb which will heal some health so just in case you're in a tight spot you'll be okay and we could go even farther than that there are other herbs that cost a little bit of time but Let's say if we if we did a race for this game at GDQ, we might decide on, okay, we'll do the safety strat and we'll pick up an herb here and an herb here just to be sure if we're all super close and we're being a little more competitive because we are racing against each other and we want to keep it close, we'll have a little extra healing items so that if, we're, if one of us is about to die, we can use those healing items 
and still keep it close for the rest of the run. Otherwise, you'd have people die at the Diamond Mines and Mew while the other people are still going with the game. And so there'll be a huge difference in time right there. And it doesn't make it too interesting to watch a race like that. All right, so <clears throat> welcome to Illusion of Guy at any percent. Time will start on start journey. So three, two, one, go. That's a great question, Gato. So I appreciate you asking that. Feel free to keep them coming. So Illusion of Guy is the story, as I've said many, many times, of Will and his father going on an expedition to the Tower of Babel. And your father didn't return, so a year later. You're going to go on a journey to find him. So South Cape is the first town. It's kind of the area to where you can showcase Will's talents, get to know what he can do, and just kind of meet all the characters. So you're meeting all your classmates. You're going to show your telekinetic and psychic powers by pulling that statue and choosing the Ace of Diamonds out of four cards. And we pulled that statue by twirling our flute, which is Will's main weapon in the game. So now we're going to choose the Ace of Diamonds, which is always whatever card we pick. So those are some pretty awesome powers. And we'll sprint back home to your grandparents' house. Where we meet Hamlet, the true hero of the story, and Kara, the princess. Gatos, have you ever... I know you watched Secret of Evermore speedrunning. Have you ever had interest in speedrunning yourself? So as quickly as Kara appears, she gets taken back to the castle because she had escaped. But luckily, we're going to have a reason to go to the castle. And we'll try to help her escape after we get there. Now, yes, Will's weapon is a flute, but it's also a musical instrument, and it does have a use. Throughout the game, we're going to learn different melodies, and those melodies are going to be used for different obstacles we need to overcome or just reasons we need to progress the story. So we're learning this as kind of a general melody to help us at specific parts of the story. But this is the last thing we need to do before we leave South Cape. Now on a world map, there's two little tricks we can do. One is I just chose Edward's Castle as a destination before I had the option. You have about a second before the options appear to choose your destination. So you can save that much time doing that. And then the other trick was when you arrive at a destination, there's a bit of a zoom out, zoom in animation. But if you hold start, you skip that. And that saves a little bit of time each time we do that. So we'll talk to this soldier to get a red jewel, which are the source of collectibles in this game. And we'll go ahead and talk about the difference between any percent and 100%. So any percent, we don't have to collect any red jewels. 100%, you have to collect all 50, do a secret dungeon, and do a secret boss. Now, for a typical speed run of any percent, for the top times, you wouldn't use any red jewels. You would just completely skip them. But for a marathon run, a safety strat, we collect five of them, 
and turn them in for an extra herb, which is for healing, and an extra defense point, which means we can take more damage. I keep saying that, but it's really... It allows us to take more damage, but we actually take less damage when we get hit. You know now, I did kind of marathon Kingdom Hearts on PS2. I love this game, but speedrunning isn't my playstyle. I think. I'll <laughs> yeah, you definitely. <clears throat> I don't know if you want to. Well, I can't even say that either. You get a bunch of different personalities that speedrun, for sure. But I think that's a good way to put it. You gotta be a little crazy to speed around. <laughs> so the movement pattern I was doing right there is just kind of warming my hands up. It's called guard dashing. It's something we'll use a little bit later in the run and for a few times. It allows you to sprint while also guarding or drawing something to you with your telekinetic powers. And it's useful. We don't have too many places that we use it, but I'll point it out when we get to those spots. So this is the first mini dungeon of the game. It's the castle basement. I'm going to be sprinting and going around corners as tightly as possible. Because this game is heavily execution based for fast times. And right there you saw me go into my menu and then back out after I killed that enemy. That allows me to run through the barrier. Ow, I got up there but I didn't sprint. That allows me to go through the barrier before the destruction animation is complete. This is a room of arrows that I need to dodge. Luckily for most of them, I'll move past them. That last arrow is on a weird timer that can block you. Health and everything. Awesome. So, but luckily that arrow fell after I got to that point. If it falls before you get there, you either have to wait for it to despawn or you have to run around to the other side and progress that way. Hoping that the arrow on that side doesn't block you also. So this is just the first instance of us using Lola's Melody. And now I'm going to hit this switch at the same time Lily does on the left side of the screen. And you'll get to see Lily in a tiny bit. Kill this bat just because it's a nuisance. And we enter this dark space. If you go into a dark space, there's usually at least two things to interact with. In the middle is Gaia, who is the main support character for the game. And on the left, this time around, is Freedan the Dark Knight, who is a transformation for Will. And Freedan has a few benefits that come with him. So A, he does more damage than Will. And B, his sword has a farther reach. And we'll use that, like we just did on that switch, to progress further into dungeons. To talk about eye frame dashing or invincibility frame dashing, we'll do that on the skeleton coming up. When you hit an enemy, it flashes for a little bit, and those are frames where you can't take damage from it. And so, if you're sprinting, attack it and still continue to sprint through it, you won't take damage, and you'll keep sprinting. Picked up another red jewel. Destroy this to move forward. Going back to do the menu. Canceling. To get through that barrier before I have to wait for the explosions. And then we're done with this little mini dungeon. No big deal. We get our third red jewel here. And this is Lily. And we'll see her a lot through the game. Because she has this weird ability to turn into a dandelion and float away. So our health pool is pretty good right now. For the first boss of the game, we would still die from one hit. But for any other enemy, we got a little bit of a breathing space. Now 
we're here to rescue Kara. And luckily all the guards are asleep and there's not too much security going on. But before we leave, we need to pick up some food because she will freak out if you try to leave the castle without this leg of yak. But yeah, Gatos, when you're speedrunning, you definitely want to speedrun a game you love. Because that'll keep you interested in it more and more. <clears throat> so, Secret of Evermore, I loved anyway. It's got a ton of glitches, which are fun to do. But what really draws me to that game is... I actually found one of the major glitches for that game. And that kind of was my in for the community when I first started streaming. So we rescued Kara, we go back to your grandparents' house, but it's been ransacked. A mercenary's been sent after you. And so Lily appears, and she's taking us to her village for safety. And because Lola's melody is super powerful, it'll make an entire village appear right before your eyes. So to the left is a pile of logs. I'll be getting my fourth oh, sprint. Come on, D-pad. Might have to get a new controller if I get accepted for GDQ. So I went into that house and left because it places Lily and Kara on that bridge and otherwise I'd have to wait for them to walk all that way. Why did I start speedrunning? <clears throat> way before there was streaming. I always tried to beat a game as fast as I could. There were games that I would just grind everything I could out of the game, but there were also games I just tried to beat as fast as I could. And so when I found Speed Demo's archive, it had a, a list of people streaming games. And I mean, it just blew my mind. And Meta Sigma was actually one of the very first streamers I saw on there. And he was streaming Secret of Evermore. And I was like, holy crap, I have this game. I can do this. Let's try it out. Now, the Evermore run back then wasn't anything near what it is now. It was a whole lot longer for any percent. And so, I was just kind of playing around on console with it. Talking with Meta Sigma and Panda and the other people that were running it. Green Ambo too, I think. And... <laughs> I accidentally found the rock skip in Act 1. But I was never streaming, so it never really got to a big point for me. So I just kind of disappeared after that. Pretty poor fight. We did it, but I'll never be happy with the four seconds left. So anyway, five years go by. I get married. 
I'm settled in. Looking for a hobby. Was golfing. Still golf rarely. I actually went yesterday for the first time this year. I've got my 3D printer right here. So that was fun for a little while. But now I was thinking, what? I can stream. I have the means now. I can I can stream and do this. And so I started streaming. I got back into the community. And it's just been great. So for the submission video, let me catch people back up on the story. We learned the Psycho Dash. We got Ink and Statue. We go to Moon Tribe Camp. We get second Ink and Statue. And then statues are needed to gain access to the first main boss. And now this is the first dungeon, the Ink and Ruins. And we'll use these statues at the end of the dungeon to fight Cast Off, the first boss. So a lot of this dungeon is charging the Psycho Dash, getting to the end of the screen. <clears throat> using it to open up the way for either a shortcut or for safety's sake or just for removing a barrier. We got a diamond block. We're going to take it back to this screen. We're going to put it in the slot behind the statue. And we kill that enemy in the top left corner because otherwise there'd be a spike coming at us and cause damage. And we don't want that happening. So this would be an example of guard dashing. Where you continue to sprint, but also guard and protect yourself from the incoming spike. And here is the first major sequence break of the game. The fight. Sprint attack. can actually damage that head. The game is requiring you to go get Freedan for his long reach, but we can kind of get around that need. And it cuts out a significant portion of the dungeon. But I want to be quick here and move relatively cleanly so that I don't slow up and get caught in a bad cycle of these floating heads. So I should be fine here. Where I can sprint and not have to worry about them circling around me and causing me damage. That was pretty good. Woo! He juked right at the last second. Well, the rest of this dungeon is just kind of sprinting around. I can talk about sprinting. Sprinting is the first big turnoff for runners of this game because it requires double tapping a direction. And it your thumb gets used to it. It might seem tiring at first, but if you love this game, your thumb gets used to it. And so it shouldn't really deter new runners. Now, I was stepping on that golden block. That's also a bit of a sequence break. Usually you have to go acquire the wind melody. And when you play that melody on that screen with all the golden tiles, that one tile illuminates. And when you stand on that for the long time, that doorway opens. But because that tile never changes, we can just go ahead and stand on there and open up the pathway. So we'll go ahead and throw these statues on. That allows us to step on this block. Now I walked onto this block so that I could hold up and it will automatically put me into this room. If I had sprinted onto it, I would have ran past it and had to just kind of walk into it. It's a very minor time save, but still a time save. Yeah, it's possible to one cycle this boss, but you need good RNG on those floating diamonds and you need precise damage dealing. Right. 
So even though that boss would have hit me in one shot and killed me, <clears throat> you stay calm because you know the patterns. There's only three patterns with those diamond blocks, and depending on what it is, you know where to stand and you won't take damage. Now there are rare occasions where that block will, that diamond block will line up with that fire snake going through, and it can kind of throw you off. But for the most part, it's a pretty easy fight. And if we were to ever do blindfolded bosses, that and Dark Guy would be the only two that I think are feasible. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that... Who the heck knows who found that? But yeah, you don't need the melody to unlock that door. You just need to know which block it is. So... Yes, the purpose of this game is to find and rescue your father. However, to do that, to get to the Tower of Babel, you need six mystic statues. And so we just got our first one from this ink and gold ship. Which is kind of a trip. There's all these people here, and they refer to you as the Short King. And there's a queen, which we talked to. But once we set sail on this ship drop back down and take a nap and go through their dream we're gonna wake up and everybody will have been long deceased just kind of weird so your father was communicating with you through the flute in the prison here you talk to your mother in a dream And we need to go see the deceased queen. You notice that there's a ring on her finger. It's a light blue ring. And for the story purpose, you just need to keep that in your mind for the end of the game. But for a speed run, eh. So all of a sudden, the ship gets attacked by a giant fish. Poor Seth has been thrown overboard and swallowed up by the fish which means at this point if you didn't get the red jewel he was holding on the ship you missed out on it so you get thrown overboard and you're drifting away with Kara here and thus begins RNG oh I need a fish Give me a fish. Where's the fish? Give me a fish. So, drifting away, there's a bunch of sequences that you have to activate triggers to continue to the next sequence. Um, the first one, I had to talk to Kara twice, and then eat the leg of yak. Here, I need to attack a fish, and then just exit out of the text box as quickly as I can, and then wait. And so RNG comes to play when you're waiting for a fish. So I had to wait a little while there, so that was bad luck. And we'll have more fish luck coming up in two sequences. So here I'm gonna equip an herb for the next sequence, and we need to talk to this message in a bottle coming up. Now if you've noticed, my HP is draining away each new day we go to. So on the next sequence, I'm going to be at 1 HP, and I need to eat fish to heal. There are no fish. Oh my gosh. Awful. Awful. Give me fish. So as you can see, depending on your luck, healing could take a long time. It could take not a long time. So we eat an herb to heal most of our HP to where we only need four fish to heal fully. Saves a little bit of time. Otherwise, you could keep that herb for safety reasons. But everybody's pretty confident to where we can just save the time. Oh, I wasn't attention. So there's something you can do here called shark skip where if you mash through all three sets of text boxes quickly, you can actually skip the 
top row of fins coming across on the final cycle. But you have to be really, really quick for all three of those groups of text boxes. And I was not this time around. So we only get one fin, which that's not bad. That's actually, I didn't lose any time from just barely missing it anyway. But it does save time if you skip that top fin. Now Will passes out because he has scurvy. Because it just got real. But luckily we are rescued. We're gonna go ahead and talk to Kara. Get our final red jewel for the run. That was awesome. And then make our way to Frisia. So there's a lot to do in Frisia. You learn that Lance has lost his memory. Okay. You can pick up an HP boost and an herb there. But the most diabolical thing that you learn about is the slave trading that's going on. So we need to rescue Eric who's been captured by some creepy dude in this corner house. And when we do, we'll get access to the diamond mine. And the diamond mine is where we're gonna go to rescue the people that are enslaved there. But before we do, because this is a marathon route, we're going to turn in our red jewels. And I hope I can talk quickly through this. Okay. So just like that, we turned in all five red jewels. They're out of our inventory. And we got our extra herb and our extra defense bonus, which is great for the diamond mine. And that's the main reason we get it. It also helps a little bit in Sky Garden and Mew, but here's where you really need the extra defense because we're gonna be running through a few different tight corridors and the less damage we take, the better. We will start to introduce the death abuse strategy here, but we actually need to be alive to do that strategy. Now I'm charging my Psycho Dash up for one of these floating eyeballs coming up, so it doesn't impede my progress. You can actually run past that enemy like I did if its head isn't in your way. Trying to hit four switches here as quickly as we can so that we can open up the center hatch. If we take too long, the switches will reset. And we're just going to be making our way farther into the diamond mine. And now I can kind of talk about the ramp glitch I did. So when you run down a ramp, it's the bottom tile that gives you the speed to go up a different ramp. So if I can jump attack and lock myself onto that tile like I just did, you'll gain that speed and not have to run all the way around to start at the top and run down. That would be a super weird thing right there. I forget I have the safety strat so I can take some damage. So I'm gonna intentionally take damage there. paused a little bit, that eyeball can turn into a statue, which it did, and if you charge the Psycho Dash, you won't damage it when it's in statue form. And so it then wastes time. Wow. It wastes time to charge another one, and it wastes time to just normally attack it. So you have to be sure it's not going to petrify and just completely nullify your Psycho Dash. So in this dark space, we learn Free Dance first move, Dark Friar. 
it's an attack that basically extends your sword even farther if you think about it it allows you to shoot an energy ball in the direction you're facing from your sword and we can hit enemies much farther away now to progress and we'll be doing that and that's the reason we came here so i'm gonna use dark fire here even though i probably don't have to but you know it is a marathon so why not be a little safe to get rid of those enemies <laughs> executing the sprint best i can and then we'll use Dark Friar to kill that worm up there, to break that fence, and allow us to rescue this guy. So now we have a key to the elevator, but the elevator is pretty close to the beginning of the dungeon. And it would take a while to get there, so to get there quicker, we're going to Death Abuse. When you die in this game, you go to the last checkpoint, and you revert back to Will's form. So yes, we lost Freedan and the damage boost, but we saved a bunch of time. Okay, what is going on? Okay. This is a new section that we've opened up. I don't know if I mentioned it or not in this mission attempt. So, up through the diamond mine split, I'm going to guarantee lose time. And that's because my PB that I'm showing on screen is without the safety strap. So once the diamond mine splits over, that's when we're going to be more comparable. So see, it petrified. I tried to get a shot in there quickly. But no such luck. Now, I'm taking damage, but that's fine because I do have the safety strat going on. I have a little extra defense. Without that, it'd be a little hairy in this section specifically because it's a lot of tight corridors and you tend to get hit a lot. Alright, so now... We have one key, we're going to be getting a second key. Without the extra defense, it would take two hits from these worms for me to die. With it, it'll take three hits. So ideally, with the safety strat, you'd want to have more damage on you right now. But that's okay. It really doesn't take too much time to take a few extra damage. Because once we get what we came here for and rescue this last person, we're going to death abuse again to warp to the beginning of the dungeon and then leave so as i mentioned lance has lost his memory and this specific person teaches us a melody that'll help us bring that memory back now the safety strat all in all costs about 40 seconds and so compared to my pv I am nine seconds behind, so I'm quite okay with that. <laughs> We're doing all right, especially for still being a little bit in D-Rust mode. So, back at Frisia. We are going to play this melody for Lance, as at this point, that... If there are any donation messages or just donation periods that you want to read off for the marathon, this would be a great spot for that because there's a bit of a, just a, a text box sequence here where everybody's reminiscing about home and feeling homesick. And then we'll travel to Neil's cottage. So there's not too much to talk about right here. And I'll give my voice about a, a minute break. Hopefully nobody... If they're not watching the full run and they just kind of skip through, hopefully they don't see silence right here.
All right, so Lance has his memory back. We talk to Eric and we make our way to Neil. So Neil is Will's cousin, he's an inventor, and to get out of Neil's cottage, we have to interact with four different inventions. So hopefully we can do this quickly and not look too much of a, like a schmuck bouncing into things here. So, just a handful of extra text boxes, but not too bad. So, after leaving Neil's Cottage, we go to Nazca, which has a giant formation of a condor in the desert. And so, after going through some more conversation and whatnot, we can make our way to the second dungeon. So, again, this is just character interaction. More donations could be read now, if there were any. ever visit any spots Will is visiting in here? You know, I've thought about that. I have not. Would it be interesting? For sure. Definitely. Um, but yeah, nothing... I'm not even sure what the Sky Gardens correlate to. But yeah, that's what's pretty cool about this game, is that it relates to real-world places. So, we've warped up the Sky Garden, the second dungeon. And I'll be walking us through this. So, there are four areas, each has a crystal ball. We'll be collecting those, and then death warping back to the main area. So that we can place the crystal ball and move forward. Now there will be spots where I take damage, <clears throat> and that might seem close, but I'm really just trying to get the most out of a quick death abuse. So I need to take two more hits, the death warp back to the beginning. Have you been to any of these spots, Gatos? Alright, area one down, here comes area two. This one is slightly worse than the first area, in the fact that I need to be a little more careful with what damage I take. Another ramp glitch there. And to get to free Dan, which is our goal, I need to destroy that sword so that I can pull that statue to enter this dark space. Again, we're going to be using Freedan's Long Reach and his Dark Friar to progress. I'm also going to be doing a little bit of iframe dashing if possible here. Like that, so I didn't take any damage. There's a quite a bit amount of laser beams flying around here, and I don't want to take that on purpose. Taking as so 
much damage as I can. So, interestingly enough there, I'm taking damage while that destruction animation is going on. Because this is one of the rare places where you don't want to cancel that animation and open the treasure chest. Because if you open that treasure chest while those explosions are going on, there's a very good chance you'll soft lock the game. And that's the kind of thing you learn the hard way. Alright, so another sequence break. Usually the game requires you to knock those pillars down. So you can sprint all the way from the right side of the screen to the left side of the screen in one go. But we can jump attack across the ramps and not actually have to do any of that. And then again, a tiny, tiny sequence break. Normally you need Freedan for this spot right here when you're playing this third area casually. But if you jump attack, you'll glitch onto the pillars there and you'll be able to get out of that barrier and get Freedan. So this lets us have Freedan starting the fourth area where otherwise we'd have to go and find Freedan and then use him in the fourth area. Okay, one more hopefully clean running. Get back out of here. No death abuse because we want free Dan. Put a swag. And we'll hope this stack or this robot behaves itself. Did. Ow. Okay, so now we have free Dan right off the bat. We're going to use this Dark Friar to activate another sword statue. Destroy this sword. We can pull that statue. I did not know that thing could do all that. Okay. Anyway, so the crystal ball is down here. We're going to use this sword to damage boost us onto this ledge so that we can open this treasure chest. Now normally you have to kill this sword to pull the statue to get to the treasure chest. If you try to walk around that statue, then you will automatically jump down off that ledge. You need the sword to bump you to that bottom pixel to walk straight across. And as quickly as that, we are ready for the second boss, Viper. Let's see how it goes. Oof! Didn't think I was that close. Dead boss. Medium fight. That's another boss where two shots and you're dead. So you do need to be careful. It's also, at least speaking from experience, when you're not super comfortable with the patterns of the feathers that he flies out, it's easy to panic. But if you just stay calm and pay attention, it's you can dodge that and not worry too much. So, fun little fact. If you want to, you can charge up Psycho Dash with Will. Doesn't do anything, but you can. Being this is an action adventure RPG, we need a little drama, right? So, obviously, you expect a plane crash here while they're flying over the ocean. But conveniently, it puts us in the next place we have to be at. Also, and after I get to these text boxes, the game lies to you. So, you can see I'm charging up Psycho Dash. But with everybody. Which means that's not everybody falling out of the plane. That's just Will copied over a bunch of times.
And so, again, if there's any donations to be read, this is a great place for it because this is a kind of boring little tiny, tiny mini dungeon. There's not much going on. I missed my split. It's more of a maze than a dungeon. You're just finding your way to a purification stone to cleanse the water, turn everyone back to normal, and then find a key to get out. Now this also introduces the theme of vampires for this area. So these are coffins with vampires in them. And it just kind of foreshadows the fact that you'll be dealing with vampires in Mew. We got the purification stone. We just need to go to the fountain in the basement. And there we go. Now, speed running wise, I don't want to say this is the worst dungeon. Mew coming up, I'm talking about. But it's probably tied for me for the pyramids as far as possible time loss. But the big thing to talk about is for new speedrunners, this is the next thing that kind of deters them. The vampire boss fight after we go through Mew. It's a difficult fight even if you're not speedrunning. You can get free Dan, but it costs somewhere around three extra minutes to go get him. And so we don't. But as a speed run, you really need to be paying attention. And this is why we have all the herbs we do, to heal during the fight. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We gotta get through the dungeon first. So this is new. My goal is not gonna be... I'm gonna try not to take too much damage because I need a certain amount of HP to be comfortable to do a few tricks. Hopefully we kill this in one cycle. Alright. Sprinting pattern there. And we'll see probably an enemy here which we hate, the wizards. Oh, the wizards! Wizards spawn with no regard for your health and safety. <laughs> Their spawns are random, and you just you really need to be paying attention when you're sprinting so you don't run into them. Little half second save there for jumping over those spikes. The theme of this dungeon is to pay attention to two statues, and where their gazes meet, you'll find treasure. And that's what the previous room was showing right before I came in here, was that there's two statues and they look at a treasure chest. And that's how you're supposed to find the Statue of Hope on the floor here. We'll take this statue, we'll backtrack a little bit, and we'll place it in the Room of Hope. Assuming, okay, I want to make sure that wizard didn't block me. So, we place the statue, and now all the water in Mew will lower one level. And that gives us access to a 
lot more area for the dungeon. And as I've said before, this is a very Chrono Trigger theme with the flames makes me think of the Magus fight. A little more backtracking. This is where I really don't want to take extra damage. It's a little weird getting back past these enemies. Alright, we're cool with that. And we're through. So, we should be alright. We're going to use smart, a little bit of a trick here. Yeah, that's okay. So the goal there was to hit that enemy, that golem, and then when it was rising up, bounce off that bouncer again to run through it without taking damage. Um, I got a bad bounce, plus I messed up. I got hit by that wizard, and that locked me in place on the ramp, which really messed me up. So we didn't get to do that, but that cost us just a couple seconds. We still have plenty of health, though. We have 10 HP. That's more than enough to do what we need to do. We got through there, we killed those slimes, so we don't have to deal with him on the way back. And we get Will's second move. So, as I did before, I'm going to charge up Psycho Dash and bounce off the wall. Shut the door real quick. There. I bounce off the wall, get a little closer to the entrance there. Now we have Psycho Slider. Another damage upgrade if we use it as an attack. But it also kind of has the same purpose as Psycho Dash. It allows us to explore areas we wouldn't otherwise be able to. So now we'll be able to slide into crevices that are in you or any other dungeon. Made it through there. We first get to use this for its intended purpose here. And then, as far as the rest of the game, this is the best opportunity I can think of to demonstrate the... Ooh. Guard dash. So that was pretty sloppy. You want to be able to hit that bouncer and get speed to go up enough that... We go up that ramp fast enough. It was a double smack in the face because that wizard, which I didn't want to kill, dropped a health orb. But, this is where the second Statue of Hope is. A little hard to figure out. The statues are placed much farther apart. But we're good to go. Now I need the Death Abuse to get back to the beginning of the dungeon. I got this extra health, so... We're going to spend a little bit of time taking damage here. So far, so good. The scary part of the dungeon itself is over. Oh, so Gatos. If you're still there, this will be interesting. I'll get to showcase another little fun... Glitch. I don't know if I got the showcase for you before. So to fight the vampires, we need, like we did for the Incan Ruins, to collect two statues. And it's at this point we really don't want to take any more damage. I want as much HP as possible for the vampire fight. I'm going to be doing my best to dodge these wizards. They're going to pop up all over the place. And 
and hopefully gain invincibility on this screen and one other screen. So I did the Psycho Slider a second time, went through that enemy, but opened the treasure chest in the middle of it. And when you break the animation of either a jump attack or the Psycho Slider, for the screen you're on, you gain invincibility. So I did that there, and I'm going to do that again with this other statue. Oh, you sneaky jerk. Well, that's a good example of random warps. Okay. Another slide. We broke the animation. Should have invincibility again. I'm going to go into my menu to equip Rama's statue. And that won't break this. So I can run through him, I can run through this blue drop, I'm fine. But now out of the screen, I'm vulnerable again. So I'm going to be careful not to run into another wizard like that or that one. And then this is the last screen where you can really take damage from a wizard. Okay, so I didn't save. Anyone who goes to GDQ... ...and can't kill the vampires without dying, doesn't deserve to showcase this game. So, we're gonna do our best here. We have three herbs, almost full HP. Let's see how we do. Focus time. Not before a little bit of swag. Wish me luck. Got two herbs left. We're doing okay for the rest of the run. So right about this point is where people start to split off if we could do this as a race. As you can see, I'm a, a minute 13 back now off my PB. The movement patterns of those vampires can really affect your time. So I had 83 seconds left. That's not a super great fight. I was waiting on that black haired vampire a few times. So <clears throat> it kind of threw me back a little bit. comes to learning the speed run there are three main sections that you have to worry about you have to worry about the vampire fights you have to worry about the killer six in the pyramids and we'll get to those and you have to worry about the mummy queen fight at the end of the pyramids so we're a third of the way there After killing the vampires, we get our 
third mystic statue and then move on through this seaside tunnel on our way to Angel Village. This is where we make contact with Seth again, who is doing Morse code through the belly of the fish that ate him. So a lot more sense has been made. Angel Village is just really a village, so it's more just getting through this quickly. There is a tiny dungeon area, and hopefully our movement's going to be pretty good. We're also going to hope for some good RNG on enemy patterns. We'll see how it goes. What you really want to pay attention to is how much HP you have after this, because it's setting you up for the next main dungeon in the game, the Great Wall of China. Kill that because I would otherwise take a lot of damage. Ooh, didn't mean to get hit by that. Maybe we'll get lucky with an HP drop? We'll see. Okay, those dragons can cost you a lot of time if you don't kill their heads quickly because they move around and it's. It's hard to time out otherwise. All right, good. That was perfect. Now, for a quick speed run, you would not worry about that bottom one, and I'm not gonna worry about the bottom one because I'm okay with my HP right now. But if you were low on health and you just wanted a good time, you can actually kill that other statue in that room and you'll release a health power up which will completely heal you. That's a, a nice little safety strat if you're at a bad spot. All right, time for a little puzzle area. Four different sections. Guess what the difference is? Orange pot turned blue. Two orange pots turned blue. There's an herb in this treasure chest, which makes me think there's not one in this one. Which there's not, it's a red jewel, so that's a difference. And then the more difficult one, the fourth one. You and your flowing hair are the difference, so. Doing that as quickly as possible, we run back. And as the story gets a little more weird, the painter that was here has turned himself into a painting. We're getting this magic dust to turn Kara from a painting back to human, and then we can leave. Because to me, that makes sense. See if we might save a second here. Save 4.3 seconds. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Just gotta chill. Now we're making our way to Water Mia. It's gonna be kind of our base of operations for going back and forth between the next dungeon and whatnot. It also introduces another bad, bad habit of playing Russian Roulette, but we'll get to that. So a little 
communication going on here. We're going to talk with Lance, who has found his father. Now, his father also went to the Tower of Babel. He's come back, but he's a little, a little goofed up. Here, turns out it's Lily's birthday, so happy birthday, Lily. And we get the biggest burn that I can think of in a game. Poor Lance has just seen his father, who's all goofy. He gives Lily flowers for her birthday and then tells her he loves her. Very sweet. And even though she doesn't respond, he says, you don't have to respond right now. It's okay. She runs away. She doesn't even say thank you. She just runs away. Shame. All right. So to get to the Great Wall of China, I have to read that letter. Otherwise, it won't show up on my map. Sprint down here, and then <clears throat> we need to choose the Great Wall of China and not go back to Angel Village. And hopefully we'll get our fourth mystic statue from here. I'm not worried too much about taking damage around this area. There's plenty of dark spaces we'll get to. So we can heal if we need to. And we have herbs. We can use them as our discretion. So you get through these enemies by doing a little bit of a weird iframe dashing. You attack up and then run through them. Not a great first area. It was nice that I got the sprint without stopping right there. Here we get to showcase Will's iron knees. There's no way a normal human can do this. Normally, if we take intentional damage there to run through that, but for a marathon, being this low in HP, I wouldn't try to do that. I'm going to do a cool little trick here where I'm going to jump attack into the doorway. It's going to carry the damage through. Oh, I messed that up. Usually you can walk through that snake without taking damage, but I guess I was a little off somehow. All right, we're going to have another sequence break right here. The game usually requires you to jump through all those ramps. Go get free Dan. Actually, go get a move for Will. And then come back up and come here to get free Dan. However, If we psycho slide in between those ramps, we break that sequence. And we don't have to worry about that. Now, because it's a marathon, I healed there. I'd much rather keep my herbs for. Oh, no. The uh, second half of the game? Or what's to come in the game? But I didn't mind losing a couple seconds there healing. We're going this dungeon a little out of order. We're going to take Freedan now and use him to destroy this archer, which is going to allow us allow us access to that doorway. 
And then we're gonna go back, transform into Will, and get the move we were supposed to get. Spin Dash. Stretch the back a little bit. Mm. I'm gonna charge up this. Go a little forward, get closer to the exit. Now we have the spin dash. It's an interesting move that gives us speed to where we can go over ramps whenever we want to. We can use it as an attack. It is useful in instances, and we'll use those a little further up. But as far as this dungeon, we're only going to use it once. Hit these soldiers out of the way. So I won't get stuck there. Okay, one last screen, and we're off to fight the Sandfanger. Now, this boss is RNG incarnate. The Sandfanger has three different cycles that it can go through. This being the first one, or one of the ones you can do where he'll jump up straight in the air, and then back down. The second one we just got was in what we call an egg cycle, and that's the ideal situation where we can do the most damage to him. The third one where he's jumping across screen to screen, at most we can do two damage, so it's another slow cycle. So, speedrunning, we want as many egg cycles as possible. And a mediocre run would be three egg cycles. We already have two. Hopefully we get another one. Otherwise we'll definitely lose some time just based off of RNG. So, all right, we got to finish with four egg cycles. That's a pretty great fight. I'd definitely be happy with that in a normal run. I'm glad we got to have it for the submission video. <laughs> Overall, the dungeon itself was a little slow, so I, I forget if I had three or four egg cycles in my PB. Looking at the time, we might lose just a little bit of time, just because of how rusty I might be on the beginning section of the Great Wall. And now we go through this long, drawn-out cutscene of suffering. So for those interested, Lily com finally comes forward with her feelings. She loves Lance too. Oh, it's sweet. Well, how romantic. Hurry up. We have a speed run to do. So actually, it's going to be close. We're not actually going to lose time. It must just have been a cleaner four cycle than I had the PB then. All right. So as impressionable as children tend to be, you would think that for a children's game, you wouldn't throw in the slave trading or 
Russian roulette with alcohol. But here we are. <laughs> About to do just that. We need a way to access the towns to the west of the desert. So we need crooks. Which are the traveling animals. And the best way that the game could come up with for us to get those is to challenge this guy to Russian Roulette. And then when he loses, you inherit his crooks. Lesson learned. So, sad face. That's done. We now have his animals. Sadly, Lance and Lily will not be traveling with us. But off we go to Euro. And it's at this point, if you're speedrunning, this is your really only opportunity to go to the bathroom. You've got 40 some seconds from when you hit A on the first text box here to where it'll just auto scroll and go up to the top and you're fine. So if you had to go, now would be the time to go. It's also another good opportunity for donation readings. place on our journey we're going to stop at is Mount K or Mount Temple and these arguing fogies give us that location on our map so off we go now Mount K with your speed running or Mount Temple <coughs> is the first time where when you're choosing your destination you have to hit right instead of down and then anchor watt and the pyramids will both be the same charge up a spin dash here charge up another one while we're still running you can use the spin dash for speed boosts, as long as it doesn't require too much charge up time. A lot of this dungeon is more great execution with sprinting. I'm going to be killing one of these yellow skulls to open up a shortcut. And then this is another one of the dungeons where we're going to utilize invincibility so that we won't take damage unnecessarily. So over the, we just got our giant boost for killing Sandfanger. As I've mentioned in runs before, you acquire all of the boosts that you missed from skipping through enemy fights once you kill a boss that you would have been able to get up to that point. And so, defense-wise, we're doing alright. So I can take a lot of damage here, but it is a little bit of a long dungeon with no heals, and so I do want to be a little careful. That being said, we do want to 
death abuse at the end of the dungeon. So we'll have a nice little trade-off of... Safety versus risk. Now this time I did a jump attack cancel. We get invincibility with this treasure chest. And luckily we're not going to see any lag. I didn't want that anyway. So you can get a little bit of lag there depending on how those fairy monsters line up. If you get three or more on the screen, you'll definitely hit a little bit of lag. Another little trade-off is how many of those enemies you want to kill. Because when I come back the other way, I'm going to generate a ton of lag if I don't kill any of them. Enough to where you can actually despawn some sprites. Like their webs being shot out. But I think I might generate a little bit of lag because I only killed one spider. Hopefully it's not too detrimental to the run. And you can get the invincibility glitch on that treasure chest too, but it costs just a little more time to set up. So we don't tend to typically do that. Okay, a little bit of lag. Not too bad though. So, plenty of health. Little damage. Not that I was really intending to do that, but it worked out. This is the final screen before we get to the screen with the treasure chest. And this is the screen we'll do our death abuse on. back out and try to get killed. And this monster does the most damage, so we'll be trying to use this one as much as possible. Going back, we have to remember to hit down to go back to Euro. Because this game has a few surprisingly dark moments, we're going to use this teapot, pour what's in it onto his parents, Neil's parents. Maybe I wasn't low enough? That was weird. Which turns them into ghosts, which means they weren't actually alive anyway. Okay. <laughs> I'm really surprised I didn't work the very first time. But that's good to know. That's something I learned. You have to be a little farther down, I guess. And it's not just an X, and X direction. It's also a Y direction. So, for those who have been watching for this length of time, I hope you do recall Hamlet, the hero of the story. Because there's that sweet little pig right now. So we'll take Hamlet and Kara and Eric. And we'll head over to the native's village. Look at that cute little pig. I think I'd seriously freak out if something happened to that pig. So those guys have to walk pretty far, so we'll go in and out of this, do something in the right area. And then we'll rest.
So the natives who are starving tie us up as prisoners. Turns out, a little cannibalistic. Pretty dark theme. Whoa, whoa, easy, Hamlet, easy. Don't get too close to that fire. I don't want to singe little piggy hairs or anything. Hamlet, no! This game's kind of messed up. <laughs> What's kind of messed up, but I don't think it's something that the game creators intended was if you're... And actually, I don't know what causes it, but sometimes maybe it's mashing quickly. If you mash fast enough or whatever, a few of those natives will continue to dance around Hamlet while he burns. A little dark. We're off to Anchor Wat. Oi, oi, oi. Had a little bit of a... Uh oh, <laughs> feeling right there. Oh my gosh, what's going on, Sliver? <laughs> of course, you catch that. This is a pretty rough dungeon, actually. Now that, specifically, is an interesting little slide. You don't actually need to cancel the animation. That spot is there regardless once you kill that enemy. Hope your day's been going well, Sliver. You got the makings of a... Pretty nice submission run, knock on wood. I don't need to do anything. Just need the menu cancel. Fast enough here, we'll go this way. Through here. And then there's an herb in that chest, I think. So that could also be used as a safety strat if we were doing a race. This screen's a bit of a pain. But that went surprisingly well, so I will not be healing here. That was awkward. Ah, well, I'm glad you're here just to see that sliver. Enjoy your festival. So we're coming up on a nice little skip that... Okay. Let's not be crazy. That if messed up, will cost somewhere around a minute and a half or so. But let's see how it goes. Awesome. So typically in this game... Probably could have took lethal damage there. Or not lethal, but I didn't want to chance it. You're supposed to go get Earthquaker, which freezes enemies in place. Otherwise, if I didn't use that, that golem I just killed would have blocked my way. And he's invincible, so I wouldn't have been able to do anything about it. Oh, you missed a lot, Gatos. You missed most of the glitches if you just came in now. <laughs> right, I don't want to take damage here. So we can actually kill that invincible enemy when he's off screen if we do a Dark Friar just perfectly. Alright, 
good. I didn't take damage there. Which means I can run past this thing and take double damage here. Another hit from that and I'd be dead. Whew. We're good to go. Yeah, Gatos, I had invincibility for certain screens, a bunch of sequence breaks. We had a great time. Now, fun fact about this screen, you're supposed to be on a zoomed out view of a giant city, kind of showing the future. But because we do the animation skip when we enter a place, it glitches that out. came and got what we wanted we can go back to the natives village and heal the three petrified natives that we didn't get to show yet death abuse on this guy by less health it would have been on the brown one floating to the right we'll go back to the last checkpoint and now we have to run back through the rest of the dungeon Now, taking damage here, I don't really care. Just as long as I don't die leaving this place. Now, I can't take damage from those bushes before I hit them while they're still in their bush form, if that makes any sense at all. And then utilizing our menu here when we kill this this is where we'll equip our gorgon flower since we wanted to cancel that stair animation and we're out great back to the natives village Hopefully, assuming everything goes okay, just a little over half an hour left in the run. Five them. And we'll head to Dao, which is the town right before the pyramid, the Fable Pyramid. Not much to do in here, especially since we're not collecting any red jewels. Just have to walk into this building and then leave. Off to the pyramid. Alright, this place is awful. No one likes it. Let's have fun. Cancel to get through that barrier. Oh yeah, bring out the war drums. So we actually do have to talk to Guy here because he gives us the aura, which is an amazing ability for Shadow. Our second and final transformation. Shadow is the boss. He does the highest damage out of all three characters. He has a long reach also, and he can use the aura, which lets us go through walls and avoid damage. And do a neat little trick called the aura glitch, which we'll show at some point probably, but not too useful yet. But to get this pyramid started, we start with the hardest room, the room that has the killer six. I'm 
really happy with how that went. We're definitely going to be utilizing iframe dashing here. This section, we're going to do what we call an aura glitch, where we attack and then aura, and hopefully, well, that just worked out. Hope I was hoping we'd knock that bird soldier out of the way, but we just happened not to take damage anyway. Stuff hurts in this dungeon. A lot. And so we want to take as little damage as possible, especially as Shadow. One hit I'm not too worried about. It's always fun to play with the background music, but <laughs> I really shouldn't do it for a submission. Try to juke this guy out. I did not juke hard enough. All right. We're going to go ahead and use an herb just to be safe for this marathon submission. We've got two more. That's plenty. Ideally, you'd have one for the Mummy Queen, if need be. Oh, well, we've got one more switch to hit before the Killer Six. And Gaptus, if you, you know what the Killer Six are, because you're about to see the Killer Six. That is how you handle the Killer Six. It's a group of six of those orbs, which are insane to deal with. And the fact that I took no damage is really good. You gotta be happy with that. No, I meant those six orbs right there. They are insane. I mean, that's, that's a, a speedrunner's term, calling them the Killer Six. It's not their official name. I don't want to cause confusion there. But between the Vampires, the Killer Six, and the Mummy Queen, those are the three hardest things to deal with in the game. So all that's left is the Mummy Queen. But I want to make sure I don't die on these last two rooms with Shadow. I do have one more herb that I can use, if need be. I think there's two more spots where I need to be a little wary of taking damage when I aura down. I frame dash through that. All right. For safety's sake, I'm just gonna kill these. And that's the end of this room. And I cut that close or what? Final room with Shadow. Unfortunately, I have to break everyone's heart. We will not be seeing Free Dan anymore for the rest of the run. I'm gonna do an iframe dash and then start sprinting again so I can continue sprinting. I'm gonna hope we take no damage here. It's a kind of a weird spot. I'm going to use my last herb there. Well, second to last, just for safety's sake for this run. Probably shouldn't take any more damage, but I'd rather not lose this. 
beautiful, beautiful run I have going on right now. Okay, so we did take damage there. I got unlucky with the movement pattern of that bird soldier, but that's why you take safeties into account. One last thing to do is iframe dash through these two soldiers. And then we're done with Shadow in these six rooms. So I didn't have to stop at a dark space to heal. That's a nice time save. And go ahead and death abuse. And use will for the final three rooms. Go to room six first. Doesn't matter too much as long as we finish on room one. And <clears throat> after we get a hieroglyph in each of these rooms, we're gonna death warp to the entrance of the room. So I don't care too much about taking damage. As long as I don't die before the hieroglyph. There's hieroglyph number four. Solar cell is flying high right now. Go up here real quick. Take lethal damage. <clears throat> For room four. I'm gonna cause a little bit of lag here. It's awful. Ideally, I guess you don't want to take damage on this room, really, because of the second area, this area. If it goes poorly, you want to be able to recover. One last area. Five hieroglyphs. Pretty good. I'll take lethal damage, hopefully. If I take too long to die here and I get stuck under those spikes, they'll just do one HP of damage at a time, and that takes a long time <laughs> to die. All right, one final room. Room one. We do this room last because there's no way to death abuse once we get to the hieroglyph. And so we have to just warp back to the beginning. A lot of spin dashing in this. All right, get our last hieroglyph. Yeah, we're looking good. Back to the beginning. What do we need? Mola's melody, of course. So this is Jackal, the mercenary that was sent after us way back in South Cape. He finally called up to us. Turns out Kara's father, the king, sent him after us. 
luckily, we have a flute. Luckily, we have Lola's melody, and we know how to play the flute. So we play the song. It's a sound, so it activates the alarms in the pyramid. And if watching a pig roast wasn't gruesome enough, well, you'll see. Kinda of messed up, right? Am I not the only one thinking that? Alright, so <clears throat> the real boss of the game is trying to remember the order for these hieroglyphs. <laughs> to be rusted if this gets accepted. All right. I'm going to go ahead and heal on Gaia just because. We are definitely turning into Shadow for the Mummy Queen fight. Here we go. One of the top three hardest things to do in this game. Look at that. Did. Mummy Queen. We can only hit her once each cycle. Hopefully she comes towards us. Did. Awesome. Oh, no, a little close. So... The first half of this fight, I'm just going to be smacking her, running to the other side of the screen, using Aura for invincibility, and repeating that. The second half is where the RNG comes into play. Once I get rid of half her health, she will either do that form right there when I hit her, or she'll transform into a ring of ghosts, one of which I can actually hit. And so, best RNG is she turns into that ring every time. Worst RNG is she never does. But we're at that point right now, so let's see how we go. All right, that was kind of bad. No good RNG there. I'm going to use an herb. Unfortunate here with the cycles. Not the greatest fight. Really? But that's the Mummy Queen. No reason to panic. So, yeah, that was. You can see I'm losing time here. That was an amazing pyramid. For me, at least. That was an amazing pyramid. But the Mummy Queen fight trashed a good portion of that time. Just because I didn't get a consistent cycle of those circles. But we got through. That herb would allow me to take one more hit, so no big deal. And finally, even though we only have five Mystic Statues... Split. 
your father communicates with you again and tells you to come to the Tower of Babel. And so finally, we go to the final dungeon of the game, the Tower of Babel. And this is another example of how the game lies to you. And I'll explain that right here. Sure is quiet in chat today. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't entitle my stream a submission video attempt. But that probably makes people not want to talk too much. So anyway, the game lies. I'm charging the uh, Psycho Dash there, okay? But then that one's charging too. And you know Kara jumps out after you. So yet again, they just copy the parachute sprite trying to make you think it's Will and Kara but it's actually just the same sprite so your 50th and final red jewel is right there for the 100% run we don't need that we're going straight into the final boss rush now wouldn't you know it the thing the king wanted from us the entire time was just stuck in our flute this crystal ring, a dark blue crystal ring. Then we never use it again. <laughs> now Kara appears, she walked through that same barrier because she had the light blue crystal ring from the queen on the ink and gold ship. So that all just kind of ties together there. What RPG is complete without a boss rush? So all the bosses, back to back. We are much stronger than we were before. They are a little more difficult than they were before, but we should be okay. Hopefully we get good RNG here. Oh, beautiful RNG. Those diamonds went in a pattern where they would have never hit me in the middle. So I could have just swing without having to worry about taking damage. Good to go. And there's a dark space there if we need to heal. If you need to heal after cast off right there, shouldn't be in the EDQ. All right, here's the Viper fight. Here is the perfect example of the aura glitch where I'm going to attack go into aura mode but continually do damage while in that state so I don't have to worry about damage I don't have to worry about dodging anything I can just attack aura and kill the viper okay now the next fight the vampire 2.0 a little more difficult than before and even though we're stronger, it, you're still going to take some damage, probably. The first fight, they didn't have collision detection. So if I ran into the vampires, I didn't take damage. This time, I'll take damage. And so I'm going to try to aura glitch without actually running into them. We'll see how it goes. It also starts me at the bottom of the screen, so I can't really get a good grasp of where they are. So hopefully I don't take damage from just a random fire snake coming down with a shootout. I'm going awfully at this right here. Come here. 
take any unnecessary damage. There we go. That was a slow fight, but a safe fight right there. <laughs> the issue I was having was I was hitting Y, which is the Aura button, when you have it equipped. Before I was actually attacking. I was missing it by just a split second. All right, here's Sandfanger 2.0. Same kind of deal. We are hoping for egg cycles. Ideally, back-to-back -back egg cycles. If we get egg cycle, egg cycle, we win. Otherwise, we're going to have a long fight. Didn't even get to hit in on that. Or that. Sandfanger 2.0 is being a mean, mean thing. Poor RNG. For sure. Alright, if he jumps up again and we catch him, we should be. Sandfanger 2.0, not bad at all, just hoping for good RNG. We did not get any. But that's okay, right? Because Mummy Queen 2.0 is going to be very generous to us. And you have to believe that. Also, the bosses we fight become our transportation. That's fun. When you start out playing Illusion of Guy, the game really seems to make sense, and then the farther down the rabbit hole you go, it just goes nuts. Alright, same kind of deal for Mummy Queen. Hopefully we get better RNG on the ring. We'll see. On the, the Ring of Ghosts. Also, hopefully she comes down to me because I don't want her throwing stones down. that off <laughs> all right we're in good position now to continue this normal pattern her down on the bottom of the screen we can hit her without her launching those stones just being sure to dodge those crazy orbs she shoots at us This fighting arena is a little easier to deal with than the Pyramid 1. The Pyramid 1 had something right in the middle here. And <clears throat> it made it a little awkward to maneuver around, especially if she was having her ring. That's good. That's good. That's good. Okay. We got a few in there. That's not too bad. <sighs> Missed it. And that's the Mummy Queen 2.0. Piece of cake. Nothing to worry about. <sighs> Looks like we're going to be good to go on our estimate that we would impose for two hours and five minutes. Assuming Dark Guy behaves himself. Nothing left to do. But a few cutscenes and the final boss. And as we were kind of joking about, but it might not be too awful to think about, a blindfolded dark guy to fight. Also, there's another dark space right there, so if we needed the heal, we could use that. Having a little over half my health, I'm not too worried. And if we fail the Dark Gaia fight, you start the Dark Gaia fight immediately again. So it's not too bad of a time loss. So not worth saving and wasting that time doing, or healing and wasting that time doing that. So this is Will's father. He 
has evolved into this spirit. Because of the light of the comet, which... You know, I haven't mentioned until this point. Is your main nemesis, this comet that's approaching Earth. Life is being affected by the light of this comet. It's changing evolution, and your goal <clears throat> is to stop the comet. Or, in this case, specifically, fight Dark Gaia. Well, your father ended up having the final mystic statue. We're going to get this, and we're going to go to the roof of the tower. all those spirits. We didn't talk to Kara. We join with the mystic statues. And Kara, being the light knight, joins with us. And we unlock Shadow's greatest attack. Firebird. Which, when paired with the music for this boss fight, sets itself for an epic scene. And if this wasn't a submission video, I would be turning the volume up for chat to watch and listen to right now. Eh. I missed that split by about two seconds, so I don't want to mess that up. Alright, we're on our way to Dark Gaia. First things first, we have to deal with the comet, and then we'll fight Gaia. Time will be on the final hit for Dark Gaia. Here we go. Now, usually you're supposed to aura here when the rains are falling to protect yourself. I don't fear this rain. I don't fear this comet. I will dodge. And possibly get hit. <laughs> I deserve that. But we'll be alright. It's important to keep in mind, we just killed the Mummy Queen, and so outside of just a very few minimum boosts and bonuses, we have pretty high defense right now. So one more hit on the Comet, and the Comet's done. Now begins Dark Eye. Look at that Firebird go. So this will either be a three or four cycle fight, depending on how lucky I get with how fast the Firebirds hit Dark Eye's face. Alright, that was four hits, which means... I'm going to need a 5 hit and 5 hit to get 3 cycle. Now these cycles can also go a little long or short. Okay. As awful as that is, this is good to showcase what can happen. So even if I wanted to heal, I wouldn't go into that dark space right before the top of the tower. I would get to this comet and then die because it costs less time to heal from this. Definitely unfortunate. That is a rarity and a shame for an otherwise great run. But 
Nothing to get flustered about. Let's try to take Gar Dark Gaia a little more seriously here. See, on that cycle, I didn't have to deal with two rounds of yellow orbs. It was another four damage cycle, so I'll have to get a five and five if I hope for a three cycle Dark Eye. All right, that was five damage. Let's see what we can get with the final cycle. So that is Illusion of Guy any percent. Outside of that very, very disappointing end to Dark Gaia, that, that wasn't a bad run at all. That was a pretty good run, especially for a D-Rust run. And obviously, if this game were accepted for either a solo run by me or a race by a few runners, there'd be a few months of practice in there, so no worries there. Uh, just to reiterate, because I'm probably going to put this video on the end of an introduction I made for a submission video. I'm really excited about GDQ this year. I've been speedrunning and streaming for over just over a year now, and the dream was to kind of run a game at GDQ, but it seems a little more realistic considering that the GDQ 2019 is in Rock Hall, Maryland this year and that's only a two hour drive for me so i'm very close to it i'd be more than willing to drive to it i'm really excited it's not like i'd have to fly and spend a lot of money for it it's just I, everything's lining up to be a good opportunity for me to run this game or secret of evermore at agdq 2019 so i hope you enjoyed the submission video there's Definitely a lot of great submissions you're going to get for this video, this game. And if it doesn't get accepted as a single run by me, at the very least, I really hope it gets accepted as a race because I think it would be a very fun race, especially between the four people in total that are going to submit for it. So yeah, thank you for watching and I hope you have a great day.